Hey guys, in this video we're going to talk about the German Deutsche Sport Model 22 caliber trainer rifles. Um, we're going to talk about why this looks almost exactly like a K98K, uh, why did they make these, and kind of what their impact was on the war. So first off, the, the DSM rifles, or the, the Deutsche Sport Model rifles, uh, these are commercial rifles. These are not... They're, they're not like a military arm. These were, these were bought um, like by commercial sale by the, by the German SA or the, uh, the Sturmabteilung. Um, the, the SA was the like paramilitary branch or wing of the Nazi party. So in 1933, the SA was put in charge of like the, the German national sports, which was kind of like all the sports was underneath like the, the national sports. Uh, particularly, they were put in charge of the shooting division and when they got in charge of the shooting division, one of the first things they wanted to do was they wanted to standardize uh, the arms. They wanted to standardize the, uh, the 22s because, of course, at the time, there's a plethora of commercial guns, you know, commercial 22s and stuff like that, and, uh, and single-shot bolt actions like the uh, Wehrmann's Gewehrs, stuff like that, that that were in existence and use in the sporting clubs. They kind of wanted to move away from some of those older designs and they wanted this new standardized 22 rifle to pretty much mimic as closely as possible the new German uh, service rifle that, that they were going to introduce. It hadn't been quite introduced yet, but they, they knew about it, they knew it was coming. And they wanted this, basically they wanted the shooting sports to double as like military training. So that, um, you know, if you, if you go to the range or go to your shooting club or whatever and you shoot one of these, you pretty much know how the sights work, how the handling works and everything. Um, so that way, you know, once you're you know, recruited or whatever and you're handed a, a K98K, you basically get the gist of it. You get, you get the basics already just from, just from your time and your shooting clubs. Um, and so that was the point. That's very early on, you know, 1933 is, you know, right after the Nazis kind of took, took control of Germany. So there's never like an like official competition or submission process or whatever. It seems to be like fairly unofficial. Uh, now the, the, the SA leaders, they kind of like requested from various gun makers. They met with different uh, arms makers at the time and just kind of talked to them about their 22 offerings, kind of gave them their ideas. And a lot of these gun makers like uh, Walther, uh, Simpson, and Irma um, submitted designs to the SA like, hey, what do you think of this, you know, 22 rifle, would this work? And the SA pretty much turned all of them down. They, they weren't happy with any of, with any of them for, for whatever reasons. It's not super well known. Um, but what they ended up doing, the SA went to uh, Mauser because at the time, Mauser was the one that, you know, Mauser Obendorf was the one that was uh, going to produce and they were also designing the what would be the K98K. Um, so the SA knew this was already happening at Mauser Obendorf, so they went to Mauser and basically asked, like, "Hey, can you design this 22 rifle that you know based on the K98K that you already know?" Which makes sense because Mauser kind of they they have the most knowledge on the K98K at the time. Now Mauser was sort of reluctant with accepting this you know task from the SA for these 22 rifles because. These 22 rifles, they were they were commercial sale. They weren't a an actual military contract. Military contracts are very lucrative for every country in the world, including even up to today. Uh, and so Mauser was looking for they were looking at making guns for military contracts and making the big bucks off those military contracts. They didn't want to have to deal with you know making little 22 rifles for commercial sale and all that. But still, the SA, you know maybe pressured or Mauser or whatever into it, but Mauser ended up coming up with a, uh, like prototype rifles and they also came up with uh, blueprints. So, so Mauser Obendorf came up with these you know, blueprints for the rifle design. Uh, the SA liked it, the SA accepted it. And, and so this is what became the official uh, German sports model or the, the Georgia sports model uh, rifle. Uh, so it, there's lots of other like sporting style guns beforehand but there's really only one true DSM rifle. And, and all of those you kind of see like after 1934. Now the way this whole kind of licensing process worked for other makers to make this Deutsche Sport model, which Mauser kind of copyrighted, they had to pay a, a licensing fee of just 200 Reichsmarks uh, to Mauser. And this 200 Reichsmarks got them a, uh, a, a, like a prototype rifle that was made by, you know, made by Mauser. And then they got the blueprints from it. Uh, and then they also had to pay a like 25% royalty. And it's a little confusing. It seems like the rifles 
cost 39 Reichsmarks um, for anyone that wanted to buy them. They were, they're very strictly price controlled. Um, the, the SA was, they definitely wanted a price ceiling on these guns. They wanted them to be affordable. So they couldn't be any more than like 39 Reichsmarks. And at that level, they, uh, the, the Mauser Obendorf's cut was that 25% on top of that. So it kind of makes the, the, the gross uh, cost of one of these rifles for maybe somebody that wanted to buy them to be about 49 Reichsmarks. But that's a little bit different because it seems like if you were a member of a shooting club or something like that, or, or an organization like a shooting club wanted to buy some, they would get them cheaper. Maybe wholesalers got them cheaper. It's a little confusing. I'm, I'm not quite sure how that, how that worked out. And I don't think anyone knows for sure how much money Mauser uh, made off of it, off of you know, the, the license to these other makers. Um, but plenty of other makers got them. Now, one of the first makers after Mauser, um, you know, was releasing these guns to other people. One of the first ones was Irma, uh, and that is actually what this gun is here. This is an Irma example, because in 1934, Irma ordered, uh, they ordered thousands, like one or 2,000 um, front sight protectors, because the front sight protectors are kind of specific um, to the DSM guns, and when these guns were to be sold, they were to be sold with a, uh, a front sight protector, you know, muzzle cover, and a sling. So all, all the guns were supposed to be sold with that. And uh, so Irma bought some from Mauser, we know that. So that's the way of knowing that, uh, that they were one of the first. So Mauser was obviously the first maker of the DSM. Then you have Irma following right after. And then you have um, Walther and then August Menz following after that. Um, so those are kind of like the first four. But there was actually about 15 uh, different firms that were making DSMs. Uh, they were either making just the parts to sell to other manufacturers or they were making the complete guns um, like CG Hanel, they, they were making, I, th I think they made like a prototype or a few prototypes, but they mostly made parts for the other manufacturers. Um, but 15 companies that made them, I'll, I'll put this on the screen so you can see them. It's, it's kind of interesting, you know, that, that so, many, so many of these companies were making it because, you know, obviously this was before the war. But this production stretched on through the beginning of the war as well. So it's kind of interesting that you see, you know, like a 22 trainer kind of, you know, sucking up wartime supplies at the beginning of the war. So now when you think about the scale of World War II, the amount of guns being made and all that stuff, and then when you see 15 different, different firms making these guns, you might think they're like going to be a lot, a lot, uh, but not that many. Um, according to Robert Simpson, uh, about 125,000 to maybe 130,000. Uh, DSMs were produced, you know, which, which isn't that much really in the grand scheme of things. Um, but we're probably thinking about this from like a modern, like, you know, private purchase sort of mentality where everyone kind of, we all own our own 22s. We don't really like share them. Well, a lot of these like sporting clubs, shooting clubs, stuff like that, they, the 22s were shared. People would go to the club and they would shoot the club's 22s, you know, so, so one of these 22 rifles you know, shared amongst a, a large group of people could kind of get a lot of people up to speed. Um, so, so that remarks, you know, obviously spending, you know, you know, precious resources on, on, you know, creating a 22 trainer was, was worth it if they did it. And, you know, one of these guns can train, you know, potentially hundreds of people and, you know, accuracy, handling, stuff like that of the rifle, because, you know, these guns, they're, they're side slung, in almost the same exact way as the K98K. So, you know, you could carry one of these around. Um, the, the bolts and everything work similarly. The takedowns almost similarly. I'll, I'll show you that in a little bit. Um, but so much of the handling uh, is, I mean, the sights, uh, obviously the markings are a little bit different, you know, for different ranges, but the sights work pretty much the same uh, as a K98K. So, you know, one of these rifles could get possibly, you know, hundreds, maybe even thousands of people, you know, acquainted or, or trained on, you know, the K98K, you know, before they ever even see one. So from that point of view, these are probably pretty, pretty handy. Now at the same time, it's a, probably a little bit of an old fashioned thing, yeah, um, training people on a bolt action and expecting people, you know, to use a bolt action. I'm sure a lot of these guys that were trained on, you know, like a, a 22 trainer, ended up getting issued something a little bit better in the combat. You know, you got a lot of machine guns and submachine guns and stuff like that that the Germans used. So the DSM's impact on the war, in the beginning it was probably a little bit more important uh, because, you know, it was mostly K-98Ks being issued. If you look at like a typical German squad, 
it's pretty much a lot of guys with K98Ks, maybe one MP38 out there to the officer. And then of course they're based around a machine gun like the MG34. So early war, the training on these guns was probably a lot more valuable than it became later on in the war with other guns. And I mean, you kind of see that maybe reflected a little bit in the war. The Germans were a little bit you know, more effective earlier in the war. Um, so it's hard to say exactly how much of an impact these trainers had, but you do have a whole generation of kids kind of being raised because um, the, uh, you know, the, the Hitler Jugend um, kids, there's a lot of pictures of, of the Hitler youth of shooting these you know, DSMs and, and the later 22 rifles. Um, and speaking of the later 22 rifles, sort of the reason why these DSMs, the production was so low is because later on, uh, the DSM rifle was replaced by the, uh, by the KKW, which is the, uh, the Klein, Klein caliber Ver Sportgewehr. Um, the, the KKW rifle copied the K98K much more closely. The, the K98K is, and, the, and the KKW look very, very similar, almost identical. Like if you just kind of glanced at both, you'd think they're the same rifle. And you know, after looking at this for a while, you can kind of see some of the differences. Um, just to go over a few of them right now, um, they inlet the stock on the KKW where it's not now. Um, instead of just having one sort of small port, uh, the KKW is kind of completely opened up. They added a bayonet lug to the KKWs. There's not a bayonet lug on this. Um, so this, you know, th and this, this isn't a cleaning rod. Actually, this is kind of, it's really just a stacking rod. Uh, it's just a piece of steel that's kind of, it looks like a wood screw in the end and it just kind of screws into the stock here. Um, just to kind of practicing, you know, like putting your, putting your rifles in a teepee. Um, but DSM production was eclipsed by the KKW eventually. So, but you will see both. You'll see both on the collector's market. I think KKWs bring a little bit higher of a price. So you can kind of look up and, and get a good deal on a DSM if you're, if you're ever looking for one of those. And you can find a plethora of, the, of different markings on these DSM guns because they went to a lot of different organizations. Um, you'll find, and it's usually just in the stock, you'll find like SA marked, you know, uh, DSM rifles. You'll find like, you know, rifles with different names or like different like party officials or just high up governmental officials. Um, they could be given one of these rifles. Um, like the like the private ownership wasn't wasn't that common. Most of these were owned by like shorting shooting organizations and stuff like that. Most of these were not owned by individuals. Um, so most of the time, these will have just like an organization stamp, like the like the post office. You'll find post office marked DS you know DSMs, stuff like that. So finding them in the wild, you never really know you know, who the gun was issued to or whatever. So it's, it's important to kind of like look at the markings and sort of know what they, know what they mean if you're looking at one. Um, but, it's, but, they're, but they're pretty neat because of that. So one of the interesting things about these DSM rifles is that they've kind of become like American rifles because according to Simpson, like 80 to 90% of DSMs that exist in the world today are in the United States. And that's because we, we brought them back. Troops, American troops over in Europe and Germany, they brought them back to the United States as souvenirs. It's a little bit different how these you know, DSMs were brought back versus like your typical sort of war trophy or whatever. It's not like they got these off of like a dead SS officer, like every, you know, like every pistol's gotten off a dead SS officer. These DSMs, these were more taken whenever like a city or a village or whatever was captured and the weapons were turned over. Um, the, there was a policy of whenever a, like a, a place was captured, it was occupied by our American troops, uh, the Americans would go in and they would order everyone to turn in all their guns. They would say, turn in everything, all your swords, your knives, your guns, your muskets, like whatever you have, it doesn't matter how innocuous you think it is, turn it into us. And, uh, and there's pretty steep penalties on, on, on not complying with that. Uh, and the Germans complied. They just basically got all their 22s and whatever they must have had, and they threw them into just big piles. And uh, and those big piles were there for you know for the occupation troops. Now these occupation troops are the ones that stumbled upon these you know piles of guns, and you know they could just pick out whatever one they want and they could send it back home. A 22 rifle was pretty highly valued by you know like the typical American GI at this time, because you know uh, the average trooper had just gone through the Great Depression, arguably, you know, maybe the Great Depression is still going on. 
and they know the value of a 22 rifle. You know, obviously it's it's very cheap. You know, it's cheap ammunition. Um, you can hunt varmints with it. So a lot of starving families during the Great Depression, you know, would harvest animals. You know, with a 22 rifle, um, you know, to feed their family. So these GIs, you know, when they see these 22 rifles that are essentially free, just laying on the ground, they're high quality and everything. Heck yeah, I'm gonna grab that, box it up, send it back home. That that'll be that'll be great to use. And in a lot of ways, these little 22 rifles were maybe even better than like a German pistol or like a, like a K98K as far as bringing home. Because if you get a K98K, you know, in 1945, 1946, where are you going to get 8mm Mauser ammo from at like your local hardware store? Like, no, but you can get 22 ammo. So these, these DSMs and 22 were probably, I, I could see these being pretty sought after by, by a lot of GIs, especially these occupation troops coming in after. Maybe not as like maybe not quite as sought after or quite the status symbol as like a captured Luger or something would be, but um, these are definitely liked by the, by the Americans that brought them home. And we, we brought these home literally by the plane full. And here's a story from Simpson's book here. Um, this kind of tells you like the mentality or kind of what would happen whenever um, like occupying troops would go in and occupy uh, one of these, you know, one of these German towns. Uh, this is a snippet. It's from a book Come as a Conqueror by uh, Franklin M. Davis from uh, 1967. It looks like he wrote this. Um, this pretty much illustrates the a story pretty well. Uh, so the American commander comes in. He says, now what about weapons and firearms? Have they all been collected? Uh, the German mayor says, except for the rifle I have locked up in here, they have all been collected by the other troops when they came through here. Probably the frontline troops that moved in through the town did it. The American commander says, maybe so but you tell your people that they have 24 hours to turn in any firearms, binoculars, swords, or other weapons of any kind. I don't care how old or how unusable they may think they are. All weapons, you hear? They can leave them at headquarters. What did you say the name of this place was? Whose house? German mayor says, um, says the name of the, the manor. Uh, and then the American commander says, uh, okay, uh, all weapons in here in 24 hours without penalty. After that, Herr Mueller, if we find a single weapon, you know the penalty. And the mayor says, I know. And the American commander says, be damn sure you do. It's death. Um, so with such a steep penalty for you know, being found with a 22, uh, you'd be pretty certain that all of these were dug out of wherever they might have been found. I'm sure all the homes were searched. I'm pretty sure you know, a lot of these homes are looted and stuff by, by the GIs and everything. So um, that's sort of to paint the picture of how so many of these DSMs made it back to the United States. Now let's get in and do some close-ups of the DSM. So the tool on top here, these are two different examples of DSM rifles. This top one is made by Irma. Uh, the middle one is made by Mauser. Uh, I think at some point this stock was probably refinished. I don't know if Mauser, they, they were this nice from the factory. I mean, maybe, I don't know if this was done like before or during the war or I mean I guess most likely it was done after the war but it looks very old it's done a long time ago if it was redone uh, this Irma is a pretty rough-ish sort of finish it's a lot more wartime K98K uh, feel to the stock on the Irma which is which is probably correct um, this at the bottom this is a real K98K just as comparison this one's made by Sauer if you're interested um, but overall you can see I mean the DSM's are super similar to the uh, to the K98Ks, especially the early ones. Um, I'll move this on camera just so you can see. Um, all of them have uh, flat butt plates. I mean, just going from the from the butt forward, flat butt plates. You have these little takedown uh, discs. Uh, you have the side sling. Now the side slings on these uh, DSMs are a little bit different because they have this little hook to hold the sling on instead of the keeper like the K98K. Uh, this was changed with the with the KKW. Uh, Semi-pistol grips, of course. Um, moving forward, super similar triggers and trigger guard shape. Turn down bolts, you know, almost at the same exact place and, and everything. There's no stock inlet um, like on the K90AK on these DSMs, but there is a stock inlet on the KKWs. Um, now, receiver length is kind of one of the big differences here. Uh, the 22 receiver obviously is much, is much shorter. Uh, the bolt throw is much shorter, um, so this is much smaller. Now, they wanted to keep the sight systems on the DSM as similar to the, uh, to the K98K as possible. 
So if I move these over here to show you, um, even though the receiver ends shorter on the DSM, the receiver ends right here, uh, the receiver ends up here on the, uh, on the K98K, there's just a longer barrel on the DSM here. Uh, this longer barrel is just to give, put this rear sight in the same exact place as it would be on a K98K so that you have pretty much an identical sight radius on the DSM as on the K98K. Of course, they could have squeezed out a little more accuracy if they put it back, but accuracy was not the point of the DSMs as much as they just wanted it to be as uniform as possible to sort of act as a trainer for this K98K. Uh, moving forward, uh, the bands are pretty different uh, on these, much slimmer, cheaper on these, on these DSMs. This probably had to do with cost, um, very cheap, but I'll, I'll go in and show you uh, some close-ups of these now. So out front here, you could probably see the biggest difference between uh, the DSM and the K98K. Um, first off, this rear barrel band is pretty similar, uh, but the way these bands are held on is completely different. Um, pretty much there's just these little pins that you can just punch out that hold these, uh, these front bands on. Whereas there is an actual sort of uh, spring-loaded-ish barrel band that holds the uh, that holds the barrel bands onto these early K98Ks, um, it's it's kind of interesting. You have to sort of get a little punch and punch these out in order to take these off. So you do need a tool to disassemble this or take the wood off of the gun, which you know obviously you don't really need a tool to disassemble the uh, you know the the bands off of a K98K. Now there's no bandit attachment points on the DSM here. Um, later on, that was changed with the KKW. They added it, but, but no bayonet lugs. Wood just kind of ends here. It's much more of a traditional sort of sporting rifle. Uh, overall, you can see that the cleaning rods on both of these guns extend to pretty much the identical distance from the muzzle. Uh, that's obviously just to, for stacking arms with the, with the DSM. Um, these, these cleaning rods are used for stacking as well as you know cleaning or, or clearing mal malfunctions. Um, the front sights are also different. You can see the front sight is a little shorter on the DSM versus the K98K. So the DSM needed its own special front sight hood or front sight protector on, on this gun. So again, it's, it's not ideal. The DSMs aren't ideal. It's not the perfect clone for, for a trainer. Uh, but I mean, overall, overall, it's pretty close. Now the rear sights, they overall, uh, they work very similarly. There's a button. You know, the left side you have to push in, and then you know the uh, the rear side slides. Um, the uh, the DSM it does not flip forward, unlike the K98K. Um, now the markings are obviously going to be different with different calibers, especially you know such vastly different calibers. Uh, the DSMs they start down at 25 meters and they go up to 200 meters. Um, what they would do is they would just use scaled down targets to kind of replicate you know greater than 200 yards distance. Whereas on the K98K, you know, it goes to, to 100 to, to 2,000 meters on the, on the K98K. And if we go forward a little bit more, you can see just sort of the overall size difference. Uh, it's not terrible. Obviously, the DSM is just much shorter, um, but it does have that slightly longer, uh, slightly longer barrel. Now let's compare some of the markings between the, uh, the Mauser-made gun and the Erfurt gun. Um, first off, the, the maker mark here is on the side, slightly different locations, but you have, you know, Mauser Werk, uh, Oberndorf, and on the side you have Irma, Gewehr Fabric, Erfurt, so this is made in Erfurt, where this is made in, uh, you know, Oberndorf. Um, you have the calibers up here on the barrels. Um, interestingly enough, these both have it in, you know, caliber, it's Cal 22 instead of in metric. Um, so, you know, caliber 22 long, so this shoots the, you know, the standard 22, you know, long rifle that we shoot today. Um, you have a serial number, typical kind of German fashion. You have serial number on the barrel and the receiver, barrel and receiver. Uh, and then here you have the various proof marks. So the, the first thing you probably noticed is that there's no, there's just straight up regular commercial markings on these guns. There's no like the military alphanumeric code system that they used on military arms. These are just regular commercial sales, so there's just there's no secret codes or anything on these. These just straight up have wherever they were made on them. You know, these aren't expected to get captured. You know, that information to get kind of you know put out there. So you don't see any you know alphanumeric military codes on these, and you don't see any waffenoms on these. 
Um, instead, you just find you know whatever commercial proofs, uh, commercial or regional proof houses that you'll find markings on here. Uh, pretty pretty stereotypically, you find either like a crown over a B, U, and a G. So the Mauser has the bug um, proof markings, and the uh, Irma here just has the BU markings. Oh, in case you were wondering, these did not come highlighted. Uh, these were highlighted in, in the United States. Um, and also, it kind of helps you see these on camera because it's probably really hard to see. Um, so obviously, on the Mauser one, you have the you know Mauser uh, barrel lo style logo here, the Mauser banner on top. Uh, then you have you know the uh, Irma logo. Um, so that you'll find the maker's codes on these, on the receiver rings, um, which is pretty neat. Like I said, there's, you know, 15 different firms that made these. Some are really rare. These are some of the more common ones out there. So you'll run into these, probably the, the, the most common. And then on the side here, you'll find the actual just model name, which is uh, Deutsche Sport Model. Uh, Deutsche Sport Model. Sport Model is one word, two L's, just so you know. So just as you'd expect from a 22, these actions are very short. Um, it feels kind of hilarious after you know getting used to like a K98K and then working this. Um, so same way as with the K98K, um, when this is to the left, uh, that's just you know regular fire. Um, when it is up, uh, the safety is on, but the bolt can be worked. Um, and then all the way over to the right, the bolt is locked and it is on safe. Um, pretty pretty straightforward there. Um, also, you have the uh, the extractor box here or the ejector box, which uh, also removes the bolt the same way as it would on a K98K. And while we're here with the bolt, you can kind of see uh, very Mauser K98K-ish, you know, um, which is kind of interesting, especially, you know, with the, uh, with the rimfire cartridge. But uh, it's, it's pretty neat. It's just a little miniature, you know, Mauser bolt. You can see this little miniature extractor and everything on here. Um, it's it's cute. It's probably the, the cutest Mauser bolt ever. Now to take one of these apart, it's pretty similar to a Mauser, uh, except there's no like little detent that you have to push to rotate this off. It's a bit like an older, um, like pre-98 style, where you all you have to do is just turn this for it to come on. This is just threaded on, uh, just like a normal, you know, Mauser bolt. And this works the same way as it would on a full size, you know, K98K. You just stick the firing pin in here. And this is probably one of the biggest differences with disassembling a DSM versus a regular K98K is that this little rear kind of uh, sear uh, cocking piece, uh, this is screwed on. It's not put on with a little uh, short interrupted thread like on the Mauser. Uh, this is just straight up threaded on. So you have to depress this uh, depress the spring and then just rotate this off and it takes quite a few spins uh, so we'll just go ahead and do that here just to show you and there we go so that's off now you can let that go hopefully without it flying away like that and uh, there's your firing pin and uh, your, your main spring there this is uh, very very similar to a k98k um, you know, except a K9K is a little bit easier. Reassembly is just straight up the opposite of that. So you kind of have to get this on. It only kind of fits on. There we go, one way. Um, it definitely helps if the safety is up so that you can get a better grip on this to depress it. So I have to press this all the way, keep holding, and then spin this on. Uh, it's harder than it looks, and this keeps wanting to catch my finger. So definitely work better if you had smaller hands. There we go. So that screws on all the way uh, where that little sear catch is uh, on the bottom. And that's together. And then you just put these together the same way you would uh, on a regular rifle. And, uh, and that's pretty much it. It just keeps going until the very end. You'll kind of clicks into place. I don't know if you heard that, but uh, sort of clicks into place there at the very end. Uh, and that's pretty much it. I mean, the bolt is really neat. The, uh, the extractor seems to have the same sort of extractor collar. Um, so I'm guessing these are replaceable, but who knows where you'd find parts to replace one of these. But uh, I just think it's really neat that it still has this kind of like over, overgrown extractor on this little bolt. 
And then, you know, you just want to make sure that this extractor is in the correct place whenever you reinsert this. Um, this isn't quite as easy as it is on a, on a regular K98K, so. So all in all, these little DSM rifles are a pretty neat part of history. Um, I actually bought uh, this one here, the Mauser one, um, for my son because uh, I, I wanted him to have like a kind of a neat 22 rifle with some neat history behind it. And also when he's too young to, to shoot, you know, eight millimeter out of a K98K, he can very easily and, and cheaply shoot 22 out of this uh, out of this DSM rifle. So um, that's the main reason why I bought this one here. It's something I'm looking forward to, you know, shooting shooting with my kid in the future. Um, but uh, you know, these are these are really cool guns. They're going up in value, that's for sure. Uh, it seems like uh, Simpson, I think he had like hundreds or thousands. The guy who wrote this book had hundreds of thousands of these DSMs, and uh, they're just they're. When you find them in the wild, sometimes they can be they can be less expensive than you might think. Uh, but when you find them online, they tend to go for pretty pretty big money. Um, so if you're if you're interested at all in these, um, I'd highly recommend um, getting this book. I'll uh, put a link to it in the description if you want to get it. Um, it's it's a great book. It goes over not just the training rifles. It goes over like the 22 conversion rifles. It goes over air rifles. Um, stuff like that. Speaking of air rifles, uh, comment and let me know if you want me to do a video on the German air rifle trainers because I have one of those. I don't want you to do it if you guys care, so let me know if you want to see that. Um, but if you have an opportunity to pick one up for, for like under a grand, pretty much it's, it's probably a good deal as long as it's complete and not messed with, you know. Um, but yeah, they're, they're cool guns. I, I recommend keeping an eye out for one if, you, if you're interested in, or if you just like 22 trainers. 22 trainers are a pretty neat little like mill serp sub niche. I know this is like the first video I've made in a few months. Sorry, life, parenthood, everything's just kinda, kinda getting in the way. I'm, trying to, I'm gonna try to make more videos from now on, kinda stay in the video making groove. Um, I appreciate you guys watching. Uh, thanks for everything you do. You know, you know all the people say at the end of their YouTube videos, all that stuff. Um, thank you. I'll see you next time.